Good to see everyone, especially we welcome our visitors. We're thankful for your attendance, and we wish you back each and every time you have the opportunity. It's nice to be able to meet in the house of the Lord, peace and tranquility, with no interference with man, Christian love and fellowship, visit with one another, and remember these things. Remember them. They're special. And hear another word from the gospel brought to you by the educated man that we're had, proud to have here. So with that being said, Sunday morning services for uh, Sunday school for all ages is 10 o'clock. In the regular service, 10, 10 a, 11 a.m. And we change Sunday night services because of the time change to 6 p.m. Wednesday night service will remain the same at 7. Uh, on Sunday night, we're still studying about heaven and the deal with it and the questions we have on it and uh, trying to use the scriptures that Brother John is doing to explain some of the questions we have, which is really interesting. Uh, on Wednesday night, uh, it's sitting from uh, 2 Samuel 24 chapter. Ladies Bible class are at 9.30 on Tuesday morning. Today after services, we encourage all our men, please uh, come help us with the business of the church and the continuation of the success of Corinth the Church of Christ. That'll be immediately after services. A few members in our prayer were Marilyn Howell, Tammy Bryant, Shirley Flowers, Glenda Morris, Glory Corvell, Mary Jeter Van Buren, Louise McLeburry, Sylvia Waits, Lydia Morris, <coughs> Daryl Smith, William Phipps, Earl Dean and Dave Sherbarth, Wade Hammock, Edward Cook, Addison Summers, and Shirley Felton. If you get your song books out, turn to number 103. I want to be a worker.
Good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Last night we had Fall Fest over at uh, Perrytown, and I'm running on hot dogs, chocolate, and coffee right now. <laughs> Adjust your expectations accordingly. <laughs> I am glad that you're here. Uh, appreciate Brother Jerry's introduction. There's a moment there I thought we had a guest speaker. I do appreciate that introduction. All right. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, Paul. First Corinthians, uh, there's problems there at the church, and he's addressing them. And he, he begins right off the bat in chapter 1, verse 10, and he wants everybody to be like-minded, the same mind, same judgment, right? He's, he wants to bring about a certain unity, and even within that unity, that unity is going to be undergirded with or built on the structure of love for one another. And so we went to a specific uh, issue, and that was eating meat offered to idols. And he spends about three chapters talking about that. And so uh, as Paul is working through the issue, he points out uh, that those in the know, or those who knew that idols were nothing, understood that the meat, therefore, was free to eat. It was fine. You know, it, it was good. But they were taking that liberty and using it to the detriment of their brothers, their weaker brothers who did not understand that. They, they grew up in idolatry, and when they saw their, their brother eating his meat, it, it to them was tantamount to, well, eating, worshiping the idol. And so Paul's instruction was to abstain. He said, if it's going to cause my brother to stumble, I'd never eat meat again. He said, it's better that you don't do it. And then he'd come right back around and said, by the way, those of you who just knew that, you know, that idol was nothing, th those are demons. You're, you're actually eating and sharing the cup and sharing a meal with demons. You can't share the cup of blessing with the cup of, of Christ. You can't do that. So you, they're not compatible. So then he turns around and those who just knew that the idols were nothing, he, well, he straightens them out as well. Again, to bring about this unity, to recognize that, hey, you need to love one another enough that you would sacrifice your freedom to eat that meat sacrificed idol for the sake of your brother. So this unity is undergirded with compassion, right? Love for one another and, and, uh, and a desire to not cause another one issues with their face. Just to stumble, right? All right, I want to look at another issue this morning that's going on in the church there. At Corinth, rolls. I wish I could just pipe the smell in here, some fresh <laughs> yeast rolls, right? Your stomachs would be growling, right? People would be drooling, and I would be the chief of them all. <laughs> Thanksgiving's coming. I'm going to get some. That's Tammy's thing is making these rolls, right? They're so good. All right. Have any of you, and I'm sure that you have, especially some of you guys that have engineering backgrounds, doctors, whatever, you ever heard of, of systems theory? And it's the idea, and it's going to be a crude explanation, but that's just kind of how I do it, right? I want to make it as simple as possible. System theories goes, uh, we, we or parts uh, are part of a system. We make up a whole, and if one of the parts is bad, well, then it causes the whole organization to not work well. So I, I, crude explanations, right? I, I want to try to, that's sharp Bronco, right? I was about 20, 21 years old. I could have bought one that looked exactly like that. I could, I was trying to remember, it was $5,000 or $7,000, and it was completely restored. 20, 21-year-old me didn't have that kind of money to spend on a vehicle, right? I was, that's thankful to not be riding a bicycle, let alone be able to afford something like that. The vehicle is a, is a whole. It is a system, right? It's got a purpose to get to point A to point B, and in that one, really stylish. But something breaks on it. Axle snaps, U-joint goes out. One of the parts fail. The vehicle as a whole does not operate as it should. It's going to perform under its expectations, right? I used the example a while ago, like for the Yukon, say the air conditioner quit, it's going to the salvage yard. You can't drive a vehicle around here without air conditioning, right? It might as well be junk at that point. Systems theory. One part fails, the system doesn't function properly. <sighs> uh <-huh. laughs> 
those of you who watch football, more times than not, especially with pro teams, you'll hear an announcer talk about how a player wasn't a good fit for a locker room. This guy with the team he was at before, he was, what you choosing the receiver? He was an outstanding receiver. He went for over 1,000 yards last season. He's, he's just great receiving. You bring him into this team, and now the team is actually winning fewer games, generating less offense. Everybody's scratching their heads. We, we, we brought in the new part. We brought in this, uh, this player here, and our offensive number should have went up. We should be winning more games. Things should be looking better. Well, systems theory, right? The, the part that you brought in, the person that you brought in, had an adverse effect. There's a clash in personalities, whatever the case may be, and now the system as a whole is performing less than it should have and less than expected. Yes, I have a picture of Arkansas's locker room. I should have used the basketball locker room. It would have actually felt better for me. <laughs> All right, that brings us to Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, and, and this is the text. It is our pericope. We're going to read the entire chapter together. It's 13 very short verses. Follow along with the screen. If you have your Bibles out, read yours. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for man has his father's wife. And you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus... You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. It's a bad situation. Paul uses the word porneia, sexual immorality, and in particular, this one is a fellow's having an affair with his stepmother. And the congregation seems to be boasting in this, uh, prideful or puffed up. Um, it's an issue of freedom. It's kind of like the way those in the know were eating the meat sacrificed idols. They knew that an idol was worth nothing. In Christ, they know that they've been freed from sin. In Christ, they know they've been liberated from the law. But there's a big difference between being liberated from the law and being freed from sin versus boasting and being prideful about committing sin. Christ didn't die on the cross to give us a built-in excuse to sin and be proud of it. That's what's happening here. This church is glorying in the fact that this guy is living in this sin and they're like, hey, forgive me. Right? This is, uh, this is the opposite of Paul's intention for the people here, right? Paul pronounces a judgment, right? You're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did 
such a thing. And this is judgment in the biblical sense. So we use the word judge and judging people as uh, talking about them behind their back, talking about all the things that they've done, reviewing their history. And we talk about that. That's kind of how secularly we use the words judge. Judgment in the text of Scripture is to pronounce punishment. That's what Paul is doing here. When he says he's giving judgment, he's saying this is the consequences of his sin. He is to be removed from you. That's the punishment. That is, that is how we're going to rectify this situation. Now, verse 5 here is not as tricky as it may sound. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is judgment day. The day of the Lord in the New Testament, that's when Paul uses it, when Jesus uses it. He's always looking to when Jesus comes back and he judges the world, right? The idea here is that we're going to punish him now that perhaps he will repent, that he will get things right, and then be acceptable once more, right? That he would turn. That's, that's the point of the judgment. Even the judgment is based on love. Yes, it sounds hard. It sounds uh, critical. It sounds like, oh, that's way too much. The punishment doesn't fit the curve. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because he's, he's concerned about his everlasting eternal soul. And such a drastic, heinous sin requires a drastic measure to help turn him back. All right, so we're going to try to get him back. We're going to disfellowship him is the term that we, we use. Boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Did you hear the systems theory in that statement? We didn't leave systems theory. We just had to get back to it. Right. A phrase we use. You've heard it all your life. That one bad apple <coughs> coughs. One bad apple Somebody has to know this saying. There you go. Fair enough. It ruins the whole bushel. One bad apple ruins the whole bushel. That's the effect that's happening here. This guy and his sin is bringing about the ruination of the church at Corinth. That's, that's horrible. That's why the action, that's why the punishment, the judgment is so severe. Paul is trying to salvage the church here at Corinth from this sin. It is possible that one person with an ill-conceived theology of freedom and liberty of sin can cause others to begin to take their view, pull them away from right thinking, have them engaging in sin, and not really do it on purpose. That guy probably believed that what he was doing was perfectly fine. He's forgiven in Christ. It's all great, and it's all good. But his wrong-headed understanding of freedom, liberty, and grace is causing the whole church to be pulled away in sin. So there's several ideas here. One, the systems theory. We see how one can affect the many, which uh, brings a focus back around. You know, Paul has asked the brothers in the know, the brother in the know who's eating the idol sacrifice to meet to abstain, right? Now we're acknowledging that there's this uh, brother here that's causing the rest of the church to pull away from Christ or from good, right-headed theology, right, glorying in sin. There's the idea that for the sake of the body, this person needs to be removed. This is the dynamic that is hard for us to 
to grasp. We, we think differently. We're not, we're not first century Jews. We're not first century Gentiles living in Corinth. And so our customs are different. Our culture is different. Here in the United States, uh, it brought, at, at large, we said Western civilization, we have this inordinate focus on self. And, and usually we say self-centered. It's always in this bad context, and I suppose in this morning's lesson it is as well. But we tend to have a worldview that is based self-first. I, I, I'm tending to hear, then I have those close to me, wife, family, those friends, the, my inner circle, they're close. And then as I, I, you get away, people get less important to me. Right? That's, that's our view. That's the way we live, the way we process information, the way we process good. It's even how we process bad. Bad things happen out there somewhere. Um, it doesn't affect me all that much, but when the bad thing happens here in my own, that's... That's another thing. That, that's, that affects me a lot. Paul is saying the whole is more important than the individual part. In chapter 12, Paul uses an illustration that uh, of body parts. We're all part of the body of Christ. There, some are, some are ears, some are eyes. And, you know, in, in that particular pericope, is the issue of who's more important, who's less important. You know, the hand can't say the foot, I have no need of you, and so on. But the point is, the church is the, the body of Christ, and each of its members, the individuals, are, are parts of that body, right? In this context that Paul has made here, he's saying it's more important for the body to survive. Cut off the body part that's causing the problem. Remove him from the body. So we have, a, we'll just say, a, a diseased part. Uh, this brother who's engaged in this sin, glorying in it, the church is beginning to be uh, pulled away because of his sin. Paul says, remove it. So we're amputating a body part. The whole is more important than the individual. That is the dynamic that's so hard for me to wrap my mind around. It's so hard for many Christians to wrap their mind around is that the assembly itself is more important than the individuals that make it up. We don't think that way. We, uh, the church service is built for, for me. Uh, I don't like the songs that are picked out. I don't like the preacher. I don't like... This, I don't like the way we do that. I don't like, well, it's not about you, right? It's about the body as a whole, what's best for the body, what's good for the body. And so no one body part is exalted above the other body part. That's chapter 12. That should reframe the way I view the assembly. Now, within the New Testament, the church, the, the word church is ecclesia. That's the Greek word. You, you, if you go to a Christian bookstore, you're going to see it written real elegantly in cursive fonts and stuff. Ecclesia. And you may have wondered what that means. It means church. It means assembly. The collective group of God's people together. Now in the last 25, 30 years or so, Preachers like me have stood in a pulpit and in Bible classes and have talked about how as individuals we are members of the church. And when I'm at my job, I am the church. When I'm at my home, I'm the church. When I'm at Walmart, I am the church. And fair enough, right, we are members of the church. I am the embodiment of the church. I am part of the church. But what happens is, is we corrupt that teaching. We press it to a point to where I am the church. Uh, Jesus died for me individually, which is good. That's an okay way to think about it. But what it does is it separates me from the body. Paul doesn't do that. The New Testament does not separate the individual from the body. Paul reconciles the individuals to the body. And so we end up with some sort of corrupted image of that. 
I am the church, individual. Whether I go to services or not, I am the individual. Regardless how I live, I am the church as an individual. And then the assembly doesn't mean as much. The people that are making up the body doesn't mean as much. And all of a sudden, in my worldview, well, being there doesn't matter. The activities that it does doesn't matter. The people that make it up, well, they, they don't matter because I have exercised myself from the assembly. I've built walls around me and have made myself more significant than the body. Paul said, cut it off. That part that is diseased and is causing the illness in the church. Amputate it. The body is more important than the individual part. It should affect the way I think about the assembly of God's people. Whenever we come together in whatever capacity it may be, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, fall festivals, sing-ins, whatever the case may be, when the church assembles, it is the body, the ecclesia of Christ. Paul put so much on it, emphasis on the ecclesia, on the collective, the group, the gathered group, but he calls it the bride of Christ. And this bride is, is the one whom Christ is going to come and receive into himself. But we tend to circumvent Paul's language there and we think about ourselves as individuals and so the assembled group doesn't matter as much. It mattered to Paul. It mattered to Christ. Their ideas of, of a group ahead of self, it was ingrained in their society. It was ingrained in their culture. There wasn't this me first, this I, this self-centeredness that we have. It's a, it's a dynamic of our culture that is by and large strange to the text of Scripture. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, not the other way around. It's just a, it's a, it's a strange dynamic for us to wrap our minds around. Paul used the illustration of Passover. That's unleavened bread. That's actually chewy unleavened bread. There's a recipe for that. I, we talk about Passover. It's usually in the context of either Jesus' last meal or Egypt, uh, Israel being rescued by God from bondage to Egypt. All right, and you have the meal of the Passover. You have unleavened bread. Bread, And that's what Paul talks about, right? Cleaning the leaven out, removing the old leaven. And so that's what Passover was, a, was about. Part of the command of Passover is to go in and remove all of the leaven from the house. None. And so what the Israelites did was they made bread daily. It, it wasn't something, you know, a lot of you guys may make bread and you keep your starter and you make a loaf here and a week you may make another loaf or whatever. They constantly kept starter going. They were constantly using that starter, that yeast, to make bread every day. Well, come Passover, it had to go. Because as the year went, there's more chance for that to become contaminated. There was chances for it to become less effective, not work as well. And so at Passover, you cleanse the old leaven. You take the leaven out of the house altogether, and you begin with unleavened bread. The Passover was about a new Beginning is about being in a new relationship with God, being rescued from Egypt. And Paul is going to talk about Passover in the terms of Christ, as Christ being our new, our new beginning. We're new, we're made new in Christ and sincerity and truth. And we're going to cleanse out the old leaven. We're going to cleanse out that old sin, that old life, that old self. And now we're going to move forward in. Christ. Paul said, clean out the old leaven. Start over a new beginning. That's what we want to offer this morning. That's my encouragement to you. Whatever your view of the church has been or of yourself, you have an opportunity this morning to rededicate, to renew, to cleanse out the old, to repent. To start brand new in Christ with a renewed vigor for Christ and His church. To exalt them to the proper place in your life. The body is more important than the individuals that make it up. That's 
how it stands in Scripture. That's how it should stand in our hearts. If we can help you this morning, encourage you in any way, won't you come as we stand and we sing our song? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing part? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul-cleansing blood?
Separate from the Lord's table, we ask to leave our store. Let us give thanks. Lord in heaven, bless this offering as if to carry on thy word and thy works. May it be pleasing to thy sight. These things we ask. 